Perlo. Your name is Jose, no? Yes. That's pronunciation. Yeah. Ah, <clears throat> hello, ladies and gentlemen. So, in this talk, uh, we want to stay starting uh, with uh, a big thank you. A thank you not to the festival, not to the audience, not to the speakers, but the only person that uh, is not with us, uh, everybody loves, and nobody knows who is she, he. I'm talking to the whistleblower of Panama Paper, the anonymous person that has made a wonderful festival for us. Thank you. So in this uh, talk, we will talk about uh, um, how Facebook is um, merging with the current uh, media and uh, news media machine. In this uh, panel, we have uh, Hossein, Gillian, and Dan, and I'm Claudio. We will self-moderate ourselves, mostly will be five minutes each, and we are thinking to take some questions, if uh, th there are, after every, every intervention. So, normally, last year, um, in the Festival of the Journalism, the Journalist Festival, there was a talk with uh, some Italian newspaper, some Facebook spokesperson, and they were talking about uh, what it became after Facebook Instant Article. They were talking about the advantage. So the advantage uh, were that, in fact, um, they realize that uh, the user is not accessing anymore to the home page. So in a news media, you don't access to the home page in order to access to the uh, article, but you, through the social media, see that some article has been published, some of your friends share for you, or you are following some specific channel, and then you reach, uh, read the, the article. Then you close the article and come back to the social media. This behavior has made uh, to the media think that uh, they were not, uh, in fact, uh, um, friendly with the audience. And Facebook has proposed this, um, this solution. My concern has been uh, about the filter bubble. What's going to happen if uh, the user starts to read only what they want? The media start to lose the possibility to define their own agenda, to define their own priorities, to focus what is, is a, of a national um, um, matter to what is just, a, I don't know, costume. So give a priority in the, in the list. And to explain uh, this uh, situation, we have to do a metaphor. We can suppose that uh, the news media is a big black box that we don't know what happened inside. And this box uh, is uh, teaching, updating, giving, giving news to all the population. This uh, news media machine has some properties and are the properties that uh, you as journalists uh, have. For example, uh, it's not censorable. Well, not everywhere, but in uh, many countries it's not censorable. Um, freedom of speech is protected and uh, journalist uh, rights uh, are uh, enforced. In other countries, this is not. For example, uh, one day ago in this uh, table, uh, talks about uh, Turkey and their situation uh, about uh, media censorship was uh, struggling and interesting. The second is that uh, the news are anonymous. So you can uh, reach a news because you are uh, listening at television or because you are reading a newspaper and uh, you are not uh, accountable of uh, what you are learning. You are just a person learning something based on your own will. And the third one is that uh, a media is accountable. So you know what a media is saying. If saying something wrong, if it's manipulating the reality, you, you know it. N not a media is objective. So you already start knowing that uh, all the media have some kind of agenda, but at least you know your uh, enemy or your friend. And then uh, we have to talk about Facebook, what Facebook has done in uh, these uh, last uh, 10 years. When we talk about Facebook, uh, it's just because uh, is in the title of the, of the panel. Otherwise, uh, we have to mention uh, Google and Apple, because uh, uh, in this year, other two interesting products are going to be launched. Exist uh, Facebook Instant Article, Google Active Mobile Page, and uh, uh, Apple News. In both, we see a platform that wants to fed the user with 
information. And we have not to think that uh, those companies represent uh, a person. When we think that uh, Facebook is spying on us, uh, there is not a Mark Zuckerberg looking at us. There are algorithms that analyze metadata. So it's something that uh, has to be automatized and uh, is uh, somehow more reliable in some, in some sense and uh, less uh, natural in another sense. So it's also difficult to figure out uh, where is the danger. And when we see, we come back to the metaphor of the black box, if we start to have um, a news machine influenced by these three companies, we stop to have uh, not censorable news. You know that, uh, as Gillian probably will mention, because uh, she's leading a project uh, about uh, monitoring the social network censorship, uh, they can uh, turn off some content or some channel. And this discrimination is in the hand of uh, three corporations that are not uh, accountable, for example, by the law, of, uh, the, the law uh, where I'm staying. They stop to be anonymous. So you stop to be a person um, that learn, and you start to become a profile with an history that uh, has some expectation, some expertise, and may maybe some vulnerability. And this uh, information are well known to the platform feeding uh, your interest. And the third, they are not accountable. Because if a newspaper manipulates the, the news, you know it. Everybody knows it. But uh, if the feed of uh, Hossein is manipulated, only Hossein is a victim of that. And nobody can say, look, Hossein, this is not the truth. So I'm taking a, a little more time. I'm sorry. We have to see that uh, the current situation is not uh, out of the blue. It's not something happening uh, only in this year. This is uh, a path that started 10 years ago. And I want to just um, identify the first behavior of Facebook as uh, a platform having some space where the user stay inside and Facebook start to know this, um, this person, start to know uh, the, the user and to monitor them, make them happy. Second, when Facebook or Google, they start with the Google Analytics or the like button inside of the other web pages. So you go in a web media, you see an article, and then the like on Facebook button. What is happening in the technical side is that uh, your browser is performing two connections. The first one is to the media, Repubblica, Il Corriere, New York Times. The second one is automatic and is a connection to Facebook server. In this connection, there are written what you are, are you reading. In the moment you click on other link and you stay in the news media, you choose an, an article, Facebook is updated. Now this user is went here. And that is when Facebook stopped to study only the user in uh, uh, its own platform, but start to study also the user in the other platform. The third stage has been when Facebook started to do an active manipulation of the user. So three years ago, uh, influence the user mood, the user um, feelings, just making a negative or positive um, visualization. And that has been a quite uh, outraging uh, result, but that is part of uh, stop to be passive, stop to monitor what the users are doing, and start to influence them. Now, I guess that the, third, the fourth stage will be when uh, Facebook will start to influence the user of other platform. But this is not possible until the platform do not migrate on Facebook. And this is what is happening. Facebook Instant Article is that uh, when uh, the content producer of the news start to use Facebook, an untrusty, an un untrustworthy platform that can effectively manipulate the perception of the citizen that uh, are learning what's going on in the real world. So I start to say that, that uh, we are um, glad about uh, a whistleblower in um, Fonseca. And uh, what uh, I really feel that uh, is important is that uh, maybe some whistleblower from Facebook can start to rise. But uh, whistleblowers are not like a diamond that uh, sparkle out of the blue. Are a person that uh, have to understood, have to understand that uh, they are important, that they know some secrets, and these secrets are for the public interest. And the journalists are the person who can do whistleblowing solicitation. Therefore, uh, I'm curious if uh, 
um, the news media that uh, want to adopt an uh, instant article will also compel, ask, um, demand uh, that some Facebook uh, employee can maybe blow the whistle about what's going on and make more transparent uh, uh, this otherwise black box uh, that can control uh, our perception. So, thank you. I want to... I suggest that we just each do a statement and then do questions just for the sake of time. Ah. Two questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes, perfect. Hi. Um, so I'm Jillian York. I'm the Director for International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, a uh, US-based organization. Um, and a lot of the work that I do looks at how social networks are creating a standard, a global standard for speech, um, and how they are censoring us. Um, my project, OnlineCensorship.org, launched a few months ago, and we just released our first report looking mostly at Twitter and Facebook um, and the ways in which they've restricted users and the impact that that has on users. So I encourage you to look at it. So what I'm going to say on this subject is essentially that. Um, I am not focused so much on the ways in which platforms are uh, incorporating news, but rather the ways in which these platforms' rules and regulations will affect journalism. So first off, we have this global speech standard that I mentioned earlier. And what I mean when I say that, and these are not my words, I've, this idea has been brought about by many people, it's not my original idea, um, but this global speech standard is essentially predicated on the idea uh, that these platforms need to be safe and comfortable for all users in every country. In some ways, we can see that this might be a positive thing. For example, Twitter uh, cracking down on harassment and trying to make sure that women feel comfortable on the platform. Um, I'm not saying it's been implemented well, but we all understand that this idea might be positive. On the other side of that, though, you have things like Facebook's policy against nudity or against real names. And these policies, I think, have an outsized impact on culture. Um, so to take the nudity policy, for example, Facebook bans nudity, and let me just read this to you because I think this is really important. Uh, they ban most types of nudity under the grounds that some users may be sensitive to this type of content, particularly because of their cultural background or age. So when they say that, they're thinking of young people, elderly people, uh, people from Saudi Arabia. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but they want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and therefore we have to be you know, very uh, American and very parochial about the human body. Um, I think that this is a sexist policy. And so I experienced this a couple weeks ago. I got banned from Facebook for 24 hours um, for posting a, a German breast cancer campaign. The campaign was meant to educate users about, or educate people, women, people about breast cancer, um, but instead Facebook felt that the uh, image of a breast was just too much and that they had to take that down. Um, and so how does this impact journalism? Well, if Facebook or Apple or whomever, whichever corporate, you know, whichever corporation we're talking about is making the rules on what can be published, then rather than the traditional gatekeeper of the editor, the newspaper, we're going to have a gatekeeper that is above the law. In fact, I would say beyond or outside the law. Facebook does not care what the country that you're in says is okay, is acceptable, you know, democratically decided by the people. Rather, they would rather you know, crack down on these different types of speech and ensure that everyone feels safe and comfortable rather than challenged. I don't think that that's a good space for journalism to exist in. I think that if we're, you know, if we're putting journalism in this, in this comfortable, safe space, then we're not going to be challenging power. And we've seen this from Facebook. We've seen them, uh, WikiLeaks tweeted a couple weeks ago that they'd blocked the link to the Hillary Clinton email archive. Um, we don't know why they did that. I think it's been since reversed, but this is a regular occurrence on this platform. How can we trust them to be the gatekeepers of the media? Uh, my name is Hussein Darakhshan, I'm from Iran, I live in Tehran now, and I used to be a blogger, but since blogs are dead now, and I blame Facebook mostly for it, I don't, I'm not a blogger anymore. I'm a freelance journalist, and I, and I also have Twitter accounts, and Facebook. I use them in a very pragmatic way, but I'm very critical of them. As Gillian said, Facebook is now a gatekeeper, uh, journalistically speaking, which is a, a very huge, significant thing, and it's also becoming a publisher rather than a platform. This is already quite dangerous, but there are many other aspects that I have problems with Facebook. It starts maybe at, at the center of the problem, I think, is its treatment of hyperlink. Hyperlinks were the foundation of the web, the World Wide Web. 
they were providing um, diversity, non-linearity, decentralization to an amazing achievement of human history, which was called the World Wide Web. World Wide Web and the hyperlinks were um, making the internet, the experience of internet, uh, an intellectual experience. It involved lots of thinking and debating and challenges. But now with Facebook and its algorithms, we are now living in, in very small bubbles, which is made for us, which is created for us, based on our habits. Um, this new experience is a very passive, centralized, uh, passive, centralized, linear, and programmed and homogenous experience, which is very similar in some ways to TV. Facebook is becoming the future of television with, it, with all its negative consequences. The other thing that it does is that because it's based on two social values, one is newness, the second is popularity, it already quashes anything that is not new and anything that is not popular. So minority views would always be unheard on Facebook. And then the other aspect of this is that anyone would be, anyone's views and opinions would be reinforced within these bubbles. So we would have radical groups, religious or nationalists, being even more radicalized indirectly by these algorithms. So I think, um, to summarize it, uh, the internet started from something that resembled library, and I would call it internet-library. It was an intellectual achievement. But now it's increasingly becoming entertainment as a result of these algorithms, as a result of these social networks. And um, I would call this internet dash television. As, and as I said, it's the new internet now is the future of television. Is this on? Yes? You can hear me? Oh, good. Uh, first thing I want to do is thank the organizers, the amazing volunteers. I see Chris. Potter, uh, Chris Potter. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, also the hardest working people here, the people in that booth who are doing the translation, thank you very much too. Um, I'm going to start from... <laughs> I just used up half of my time, I think. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start from uh, the point of view that sort of what they said, I, uh, by all of it, I'm, I think it's important that we keep saying it. But what I'd like to do is, um, in my blog, I posted something today. Uh, I'm still doing it. <laughs> uh, rare breed. About what, what, I'm, what I want to talk about is, OK, we have a problem. Now what do we do? do about it beyond saying what the problem is. And I have a few proposals. Uh, this is a, I've made a fairly rough draft of where I'm going with it because I think we've got to get going and, and uh, do things. And I'll just tell you five things that I think we could do uh, in order of uh, probably the easiest first and then the most difficult uh, toward the end. And I say this with great admiration in many ways for Facebook as a technical achievement, as entrepreneurial genius, as uh, you know, extraordinary things. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, why we should not just concede and give up and, and capitulate to the Facebook uh, leviathan. So the, the first thing I would like to see, and this is aimed at journalists, I'm, I'm speaking to journalists here, the first thing I'd like us to do is, uh, th there's a uh, saying uh, that the first rule of getting out of a hole that you're in is to stop digging. 
I wish that journalists would stop digging. Sadly, they have not only, they, they did put, they put away the shovels, but then they brought in uh, big earth moving equipment to go even deeper uh, with instant articles. And I would like them to just stop and maybe not go further for the moment and think about what they could do. Um, second, I'd like to see journalism organizations explain to their communities uh, of interest or geography, uh, their readers, audience, whatever we call them, exactly what's going on with the uh, increasingly not open internet and Facebook in particular its part. And that's a whole list of things. I won't go through them, but I'll, the, the, the shorthand is the, the privacy implications, the control of speech that you've heard about, the, the Facebook's wish to be essentially an alternate internet uh, uh, and the, the evolving ethics uh, at the company, among other things. It feels important to me that our audiences, our communities understand what's going on, and I don't think they really do. And that's a failing of journalism, in part. Third, I would like to see journalists do something they've done other times when freedom of expression, freedom of speech, uh, has been in jeopardy and something that I wish lots of other people would join in, which is to recognize that Facebook is becoming effectively a monopoly. And that Mark Zuckerberg himself said, well, we want to be like electricity. What he means by that is he wants to be a, a utility. <laughs> well, what do we do with utilities if, if they get to be that powerful? We regulate them. I don't like regulation, but and if regulation should be done with the lightest possible touch. But it's time for governments to look at these things and say, hmm, something's problematic here and we gotta figure out what to do about it. So th the, that's the third. The fourth thing is once journalists have, have explained it all, they need to help the communities they serve take some actions in those communities, and by that I mean to uh, explain again to the people what are the what are some countermeasures to the uh, what what uh, Shoshana Dubroff has called the uh, surveillance capitalism. What are what can we do to block some of this stuff and, and free ourselves from something that's really quite pernicious? Uh, what, how can we use encryption? How can we uh, do things that will help us? Uh, get past this, how can we campaign, okay, sorry, how can we campaign uh, ourselves for change uh, in our communities, local, state, federal, global, to think about uh, getting to people who can make political decisions and encouraging them to make ones we believe are the right ones. Finally, and the, I'm at the hardest one, which is I think journalists need to uh, be thinking about first, but then actively finding ways to move out of the closed ecosystems that are being created and back into an open internet that cannot be locked down. And that means I, don't, I do not expect journalists to build this because they're not competent to do it. But journalists should be encouraging developments in this area and uh, encouraging in particular a part of the uh, overall community that they've not encouraged enough, and I'm talking about philanthropy and foundations, which I think have an enormous role in helping to, to build and encourage and, and help uh, reopen and lock open the internet. So those are five quick things. There's more detail on my blog today, but uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to do things and uh, I, I'll still worry like crazy, but I want to get going. So let's all maybe get going. Yeah. Should we open up for questions? Uh, I have, I, I want to add two, two things to what Dan said about um, suggestions of how we can at least improve our own experience to some degree. Apart from a pressure that should be on the government to, to force Facebook to open up its algorithms, at least, to, to make it transparent so we know what they're doing, how they are ranking things, and how they are representing these vast amounts of information. We also can do things on our, ourselves. 
And my suggestion is a very simple thing. In order to get out of this comfort zone and to be sometimes surprised, which is something that is being deprived from us, instead of liking what we like, we can start liking what we dislike. <laughs> and that's a way we can see things that we, not necessarily, we don't necessarily agree with and then we would also, be start, we would also start to be surprised. So we want, to, we want to poison their data pool, I think that's what you're saying. Uh, to disrupt their algorithms, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are microphones uh, in the room. Somebody here? Right here. Yeah. I, I will borrow an expression that surely uh, will be like to Dan Gilmer, and, the, and that's the way it is. So where we are going, um, does a journalist feel into a cybernetic cage? I didn't quite get it. I, I, I apologize. I didn't quite understand the question. Could you? Sorry? I didn't fully understand the question. I'm um, sorry. I borrowed an expression of Walter Cronkite, and, and that's the way it is. Does a journalist feel himself caged in cybernetic world now? But due to extremely increasing power of uh, incorporating like Apple, Facebook, Google. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. I, I, I don't want to see a return to uh, a few enormous enterprises, and it's not solely Facebook. The telecom carriers are quite alarming in their own way. There's lots of players here, and governments applying enormous pressure. But uh, when, you know, I, re I revere Walter Cronkite for having been a great journalist and for doing a lot of wonderful things, but when he said, and that's the news, well, it was only part of it. And we, uh, the opportunity to get much more nuance and depth on things we're, that we care about has, is, that's what the internet has brought us. Uh, and I, think we have to, you know, pursue that, and there are lots of ways to do it, but that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm terrified that Facebook could end up picking the winners in journalism. I, I don't want to, I, I, you know, I'm quite sure I won't be one of them. And uh, most of the people in here uh, probably won't be in the organizations that are picked. So we have, you know, the, Let's, let's, let's escape from that cage. Yeah, I'd like to add as well, I mean, Hossein said something, um, I wrote it down, where is it? The, well, the thing about, I used to be a blogger, blogs are dead, I blame Facebook. I mean, Facebook and Twitter and et cetera, et cetera, from my perspective. Um, but I think one of the interesting about things about that is, okay, so Facebook and these social media platforms have made us bloggers into freelance journalists, and I would agree with that statement. But it, they've also made everyone into a public figure in a way that is very strange and encouraged us to have these pithy thoughts, um, post these, you know, bits. I mean, I, I, I'm not joking when I, you know, I look in the Instagram feed and whatever, and it is really all food pictures um, from, you know, maybe I'm following the wrong people. But I think it's created this sort of culture of, of oversharing that, you know, I mean, I'm not here to criticize that. That is what it is. But at the same time, um, we're... You know, I, I was talking, chatting with somebody in this room at lunch earlier about uh, about how it's kind of you know created this this expectation that every time you say something on one of these platforms, you could become the news. That journalists go after quotes and and you know find these quotes from Facebook or from Twitter and post them often without permission. Um, and I think that you know that shift in journalism is not necessarily a good thing. Now going back to having you know Facebook as the central platform, I think that we're, we're just kind of watching the machine eat itself. Um, and I, I don't know, it worries me. There's a couple of questions uh, here and there. Who has the microphone? Jesus. Oh, <laughs> right in front of us, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Helen Derbyshire from Access Info Europe. Um, thanks for the panel. Um, you've identified a couple of key concerns. The, the question of the algorithms which um, feed us what we will actually see and the questions of censorship. And it seems to me we're living in this very fast moving situation which has blown out of the water the current 
structure that we've had for protecting freedom of expression um, and for ensuring plurality and diversity in the content that we receive or allowing us as uh, citizens, as consumers, to know where it's coming from and how it's being selected. So my question that I'd written down before the panel started was um, how should we address this? What should we do about it? And thanks, Dan, for the initial list of um, some areas that we should be working in. I have a very specific question which came up in response to a question I asked on a panel in this room yesterday about the same time, um, which is about the algorithms that are being used. And there was a little discussion about transparency of the algorithms, and then somebody said, well, you know, these are the, the, the business model and they're trade secrets and they should be protected. So my question I'd really like to know from each of you as the panelists, do you think that that is the case? Is it a bit like, I'm trying to think of a sort of simile, is it a bit like the, the, the recipe for Coca-Cola? We don't know the exact recipe, but we are, we are able to know how much sugar there is in Coca-Cola at least, and how much caffeine. Or do you think there's an actual public interest in us knowing a lot more than that? And if so, how should we precisely, specifically start campaigning to get those algorithms made public? And do you think that that's really possible? And projections on the time frame in which we might achieve that? Thank you. It's a great question. <laughs> well, I will cover just one section of uh, this question. <laughs> The secret receipt, I, this idea started uh, when uh, Google started to say, I'm, we're going to use a much more indicator to create uh, your answer on the search engine, because otherwise, uh, websites pollute our results, and they put themselves on top. So their secret was uh, uh, sell as a sort of uh, necessary countermeasure against uh, spammers. That was uh, for Google search engine, and this remained in our mind, but. Uh, Honestly, uh, also for me, one of the long-term political goals can be to see that uh, social network uh, disclose which algorithm run over our data and uh, disclose also which kind of uh, treatment our data suffer. Because, uh, you know, so on uh, the um, European data protection, your personal, identified data, your personal data is also what can identify you univocally. So, my name, uh, my um, DNA, etc., there for sure. But uh, my profile is something that, uh, if associated to me, is a personal data. If I've not associated instead uh, behavior to something uh, that can be linked to me, that is not a personal data. So, what I want to say, when uh, they elaborate our the data that are given to Facebook, they can start to anonymize this data. When a data is anonymized, became not covered anymore by the law. So my concern is to know how this data get anonymized. They can be anonymized in a second time. We don't know, but uh, if we make this process transparent, we can start to raise this question. So algorithm transparency, open data about the metadata collected. Uh, yeah, because, you know, having a single place that contains uh, metadata of all the population cannot be a so bad thing. It can be also an asset for a municipality to understand uh, how the person are moving or uh, how a uh, new generation is uh, changing their mindset in order to uh, update the public uh, things to, to cover these needs. So it can be a, a, a possibility for the society, but it cannot be an asset of Facebook and Google and Apple. And, uh, just to come back to the asset topic, I guess are not the algorithm, the secret receipt. It's the monopoly, it's the network. The value of WhatsApp was because it was the monopolist of the mobile instant messaging. And the value of YouTube years ago, that has been one of the biggest banks for that time, was because it was the monopolist of the online video. So at the moment, Facebook has three monopoly, social network, uh, image sharing with Instagram, and uh, instant messaging with Facebook. So, and WhatsApp, that uh, by the way, the spider uh, is uh, encrypted. Well, sorry, this would be a really long topic. Uh, yeah, do you want to? 
Do you want, no? Okay, um, mine's quick. Um, I'm not much of a capitalist, so you're not gonna find me defending trade secrets anytime soon. Um, <laughs> in any circumstances. However, um, I think to get to the what should we do about it, that's, you know, and I, I also am not really in a position to be calling for regulation as well. So I think that ultimately what it comes down to is, you know, the project that I'm working on um, that I mentioned earlier, online censorship, we, the reason that we exist, um, and this is more about censorship than algorithms, but I'll get there. The reason that we exist is because for years, these companies have absolutely refused to put out transparency reports on the way that they take down content based on their terms of service. So Google and Facebook and all of these companies have made this big show of their transparency reporting, but it focuses purely on government takedown requests and government requests for user data. That's a great thing, and I give them props for that. Um, we've been pushing them for years, so it's great that they're there. Um, but uh, they've you know, obfuscated on the question of what constitutes hate speech, what constitutes terrorism. And we know now from my project and from other projects that are coming out um, that what constitutes terrorism on Facebook is sometimes actually statements against terrorism. What constitutes hate speech is sometimes comments like, fuck America. Um, that's not hate speech and that's not terrorism. And I think that we, like, we've decided to just circumvent this, this ask and go for it ourselves and get, you know, crowdsource that, that data. So please come to me if you ever get stuff taken down, I wanna see what you're getting. But when it comes to algorithms, you know, I think it's kind of the same thing that these companies are not going to put that out there and so we need to find ways to subvert the process and get at it ourselves, um, whatever that takes. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, I'm, uh, I, I am kind of a capitalist. Um, <laughs> and I, I would love the market. I would love a market solution to this. That would be the best thing if we, if we could have one. Uh, and perhaps we could have one if enough uh, of the uh, foundation community got together and helped put together a, a open, federated, unlockable uh, uh, collection of technologies. But they'd be still up. You know, they'd be rounding errors financially against what the big companies can do. And if, if we have market failure, that's the time that government does have to step in at some level. But I, I'm uh, forcing open the algorithms, and I'm really skeptical of that. And I think there are other, uh, other lighter touch things that could be done. Um, can I add something? Um, one other thing in addition to maybe instead of opening up algorithms, could be uh, a public demand uh, that would f put pressure on Facebook to, um, to give us the option of choosing different kinds of algorithms. Um, if we can, for example, choose between two, three, four types of algorithms, for instance, uh, one algorithm that would that Banner would favor, for example, things that are not new, something that favor news, something that favor um, personal um, family connections and friendship news, uh, news about your family and friends and that kind of stuff. So basically make it customizable. That's also another solution that I think would be achievable if there is enough public pressure on them. Um, and I also want to add two very scary statistics about, one is about privacy, one is about um, the general idea of how uh, people are actually interacting with Facebook. Facebook can know us, based on a study, recent study last year, Facebook knows us better than our parents with only 300 likes. And it knows us better than our spouses with only 150 likes. That's how powerful um, they can be in our lives, all aspects of our lives. And I think, and I argue that the power that they, um, they have now on our lives is in some ways more than the power that democratic governments have on our lives. Mm -hmm. They de determine what we buy, what we think, what we read, ha who we date. All these kinds of algorithms are controlling our lives more than the governments are uh, doing that. And then, the other sad thing is that in the developing world, Facebook is so huge that in Brazil and India, more than half of the people think that the internet is Facebook. And they're not helping that with the free basics programs. <laughs> yeah, so other questions? Uh, 
It's, uh, my name is Giulio Carini of Riparte il Futuro, which is an Italian NGO that fights corruption in, in Italy. Uh, my, so the picture, it seems, that you're painting is one where Facebook is this menacing, controlling, potentially ominous force that could or is brainwashing us. Um, but my, I wanted to challenge you on that in the sense, could it be, is it just an overstatement? Because yes, we obviously look at Facebook to get to get news uh, from, to, to feed us news, but isn't it just one of many sources where we get news and, the, and to play with your television metaphor, isn't it that, okay, you have, the te you have a television, you can switch channels, but you're still on television, but with Facebook, it's one of the many channels on this hypothetical uh, television, because do you have data suggesting that we only, it seems like you're, you're saying we only look at Facebook as a source and we don't then, mm -hmm are not aware enough to say, okay, well, I want to get an ulterior source of news, or I am uh, almost aware that there's a subconscious yeah. uh, push for something, so therefore I will, I will go somewhere else. So is there one in the data, or just your opinion on, on you know, that, there's, if there's, there's an overstatement? There's lots of data on this, that you're, and you're, you're a, uh, you are someone who uses the internet uh, in uh, broader and more nuanced ways than a lot of us do. And, Ask news organizations where their traffic comes from, and uh, it's overwhelmingly now heading toward Facebook, coming from Facebook. It in uh, th it, it's now something they uh, they've recognized it. That uh, read Emily Bell's wonderful piece called "Facebook is Eating Journalism" or something like that. Um, uh, Emily has uh, is someone to pay attention to having, you know, she ran electronic uh, for the Guardian. She's uh, now a very important scholar in this area. And her point is, I, I don't agree with her solutions particularly, but I think Emily has identified that issue. And we are speaking more about journalism here. I, I recognize Facebook as a wonderful service for certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. People staying in touch with friends and family. It's great for that. I don't happen to use it for that, but I'm in a, in, you know, in a minority and it's getting harder and harder to opt out. Uh, if uh, I, I don't care if I don't get, uh, if I miss a lot of parties, I'm, I'm, I'm over that. But there's a, there's a lot of reasons why people feel they're just obliged to be there and the increasingly it's where their news is coming from. Can I, real quick, um, so two things to that. One, um, raise your hand if you have a relative or a friend who has opposite political views to you and posts about them a lot on Facebook. Most of you, a lot of you. Okay, so this is anecdotal, but I've watched um, one of my very right-wing American relatives become increasingly more, more and more right-wing, posting more and more horrifying stories to her Facebook page over the time. Eventually I blocked her. Anecdote, sure, of course, but We've all seen this happen. We've all seen people kind of get mired in this, I mean, what I think has been, what, what is it called, the bubble, the filter bubble, right? And I do think that that's a fear. The second thing to how big and monopolistic Facebook has become, the piece that I wrote last week for Quartz, I talked about how the ban on Facebook for me for t just 24 hours, and let me just note that some people receive up to 30 day bans on Facebook for violating the rules. Um, within that time, I could not post comments on many news sites, including the Huffington Post, which use Facebook comments exclusively. I could not use Tinder, I could not use Spotify, I could not log into Airbnb, I could not um, administer pages that I use for work. Mm -hmm. Facebook, you can't opt out. I mean, you can, but you're going to be, as you know, sometimes it's about getting the invitations well, to the parties, I but. Opting out it was, there are, it's not opting out, you never opt out because it's obviously now so much social pressure to be there, but you can also, there are other well then, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. You've just I, I meant saying not opt, I was sorry. Um, I was saying that I didn't mean to say you can opt out, that you, because obviously that's impossible nowadays, but it's not like opting out, for instance, television, where you just shut it off. There are other sources of news that you can 
you, you can you can find information and you know it's not just Facebook. Well, and even if I, I go on Facebook yeah. in the morning, which I do, then I'll go on an, on on a, you know 20 other news sites. Look so at will stuff. I. So will I. You're but unusual. My, uh, but the, exactly. the relative that I mentioned, and that's why I brought up that anecdote. The relative that I mentioned does not. She clearly gets all of her news from Facebook and is becoming increasingly right wing. And again, it's an anecdote. But I think we've all seen this happen. And I would say that. You and I and the folks in this room are probably better news consumers than the average person. You have to think as a systemic problem. So now we are addressing not something that is a totalitarianism and will take over our life 100% tomorrow. Just a matter of percentage. So if truth that the top 100 websites in Italy contain for the 90% of the time Google Analytics, this means that 90% of your behavior quite likely is monitored. Also if you say, well, I'm not using Google, I'm using that, that go. Or, so it's a matter of a systemic uh, tendency, and uh, the news media is the fourth state. Uh, they have to challenge uh, all this kind of power. They instead may risk uh, to enforce, uh, to empower more an already existing uh, new structure. So that is the main concern. Of course, uh, you can also use uh, the dark net to find your net for your, your news better. Other questions here? There's someone yeah. in the back here. Do, can we get a microphone? Or? Uh, I'm Julian Leopold from Germany. I used to run BuzzFeed Germany, which automatically makes me uh, uh, a Facebook supporter, I guess, <laughs> because I had to work with them a lot. And I can understand a lot of the concerns that you mentioned here. I do have a little bit of a problem with the picture of the perfect journalist who turns into a martyr because Facebook censors what he writes or... Um, blocks his access to a broader public. I just uh, tweeted because um, obviously I use Twitter too. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, I don't know, um, I'm a fan. Um, that for instance, if you're running a local newspaper and we have that in Germany, um, you have to be really cautious what you write because you don't want to piss off your advertising people, like the people putting money into your newspaper. And we have cases of right-wing extremists slashing your tires or throwing stones into your office. So the, my, my point being the, the dependency on factors outside your job has always been part of journalism. That's just something I would like to, to point out. My question for you guys is how do we make people care about all of the negative sites that are d without doubt there on Facebook? Because we might discuss privacy issues or the data collection. Nobody cares. I can tell you, like, I've been writing about this thing for 10 years. The broader public doesn't care. They see so much um, good things in Facebook that they just use it. So is there a, a way of, I mean, I don't ask for like a magic wand, but what are ideas you, you guys think about? You, thought, you brought up the poisoning idea. I think it's awesome. Like, do you think about putting that into a campaign? For instance, I have something. I've been talking too much. You guys should go ahead. Go ahead. Well, um, campaigning is a solution. You have to somehow create alternatives. And uh, one other uh, thing that uh, I'm quite fond to think about is uh, civil disobedience against a social network. Because uh, if they represent a new structure of power, you, as a citizen, want to react. So those can be this reaction. Polluting the information can be something. Or, uh, for example, uh, reduce their power of uh, linkability. So you are an, uh, an identity, a person with a family, a job, uh, some hobby. And uh, when, if in theory I use Facebook uh, for all these things, I'm a unique individual with uh, all this backstory. If instead I use uh, four different browsers, there are simple ways to do it, and uh, four different identity, and in every identity I express just uh, something and I've only the, the reduced amount of uh, friends I need, I'm creating, I'm using the benefit of Facebook without uh, all the, mm, the problems uh, deriving. I can use uh, add-on like uh, Facebook Purity. FB Purity is the name. It's an ad blocker in the sense that it uh, reduces the, the advertising on Facebook page. Also, ignore the algorithm of, the, mm, of Facebook show to you the chronological order of the post instead of the algorithm that uh, otherwise can manipulate you. 
and add also other features. So this kind of technical solution can be integrated with a com campaign. But this campaign has to be, of course, uh, felt uh, touching the, um, the user needs. We can agree that uh, for a, a Western country, Facebook has just represented some benefit. Now we have to wonder if we are creating a global monopoly, if uh, this uh, um, peaceful status can uh, remain, uh, remain forever, or if we are not just creating uh, the next entity able to selectively decide uh, who is the next victim and who is not, because that is the, is the real concern in the long term. Uh, and that is why we are raising this point. But uh, currently, for us, uh, we don't feel this kind of risk. Um, sorry. I also think, uh, I just want to add something, that in, maybe in the US it would be difficult to regulate Facebook, but it's very possible to do it in other countries, especially Europe and in, in some other countries that are sensitive about monopolies and sensitive about um, private company that would be dominating certain aspects of people's lives, a large number of people's lives. So I think it's um, worth um, looking into and exploring the possibility of bringing, uh, proposing legislation in parliaments in many, many, uh, many European states, for example, to regulate Facebook, to open it up, to, to make it more transparent. Um, and one thing that I want to add w about hyperlinks is that um, the way f Facebook allows you to put hyperlinks, but it treats them as objects, not as relationships. It showcases them, it frames them in a very nice, good-looking way, and it deprives the hyperlink from its power of, from its um, non-linear power, from its um, informative power that would relate you to different kinds of texts outside itself. What they try to do now, and you see that in Instagram, which doesn't even allow links at all, is that they want to keep you inside them as, as long as possible. And this is contributing a lot to their monopoly on the time that, and, the ten, and the attention that people are giving to, to them. Um, and just want to add something finally that I've written a long essay about these aspects. Um, it's called The Web We Have to Save in English and it was also translated into many languages including Italian and it was published by Corriere della Sera. You, you can see the, the arguments expanded. Who has the microphone? The last question? Yes, uh, Giuseppe Manziotti, I'm a law professor, Trinity College Dublin. I also uh, am an advisor about media-related issues. Let me start by saying I don't agree with the speaker who said that Europe has higher chances to use antitrust to face uh, this kind of power by Facebook. I think the US is much better in this respect. Traditionally, it has been much stronger. What Europe does is tackling abuses of dominant position that are more difficult to prove, as you, as you might remember from what Europe that did. So I disagree from a technical perspective about what you said. Um, I was surprised by the fact that, you know, there was no, uh, no one from Facebook in this panel. It would have been just fun to have someone from them. We invited them. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure. And it was, I w it was surprising to see uh, a couple of hours ago uh, a panel uh, where Google guys presented the Google Di Digital News uh, Initiative. You know, Google is regarded uh, by the publishing industry, by the newspaper industry, as the enterprise that killed your industry. It's killing journalism in economic terms. So I would have found uh, uh, suitable to put these two panels together in order to, uh, to face an issue from both an economic and a content-related perspective. Because you are targeting the, the problem from a content-related perspective, saying Facebook is censoring what we do, right? Um, what I'm very skeptical about, since uh, uh, Facebook is a proprietary platform, you cannot really uh, uh, enforce certain values within a proprietary platform unless you use certain legal tools, the most important of which is certainly antitrust. But when you consider how pervasive uh, the enforcement of terms and conditions by Facebook uh, is, and when you consider um, how little 
as someone said, the, the journalist from Germany, is the awareness of the users of Facebook about the binding force of these terms. You understand that this, this kind of environment is, how can I say, is hopeless. <laughs> Unless you want the states to undertake a, a, an approach that would be regarded as excessively intrusive and would actually give other governments last comment, which is that it took some years for us to get in the situation we're in. Uh, we're not going to get out of it quickly, if we ever do, and all I'm asking is that we try and that we start, like, now. So, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Well, uh, yes. I like it. It's, uh, oh, good to see you as well. I like it. It was good. Those are all good. Yeah. Right? yeah.